Welcome to the David Ramsey Map Center um, and our February event. Uh, it's amazing that we've been doing this now um, for over, over a year, almost a year. Um, we started, I think, in April uh, with our first uh, Zoom event when we had to work. And uh, we're very um, grateful for all of you for showing up, uh, signing up, showing up, and, and you know, coming to these talks. Um, let me, uh, I am, I'm receiving a text. Okay, excellent, things are, things are good. Um, uh, so uh, just a little bit, um, um, again, uh, I, I don't know if I introduced myself. My name is Salim Mohammed. I'm head and curator of the center. Um, first, I wanna sh uh, just share some housekeeping details. Um, in the next couple of hours will go something like this. Um, I will give you a, a preview of next month's event. Um, I will then introduce both our speakers. Um, both will speak for about 40 minutes each. Um, Steve Pine will, will go first and then Gray uh, Brechen. Um, we're very grateful to have them come and create this mini symposium uh, for all of us, most, many of us, especially in the West and of course, California, this is a big deal. Um, uh, just in terms of the questions and answers, please add your questions to the Q&A box uh, when you think of them. Uh, and then remember to be specific because uh, they will be answered at the very end. You can also choose to just uh, hold off to your questions to the very end and we will monitor, I will moderate, and uh, we will definitely do our best to get at least one question from each person uh, asked and answered, hopefully. Uh, I expect um, um, I expect that um, uh, I expect that uh, we do about uh, thirty minutes of um, of Q and A, uh, and you know usually these are really popular these Q and A sessions, especially with Zoom. A lot of people are asking questions, so looking forward to that. Um, let me um, share my screen here quickly um, to show you next um, uh, next month's event. Um, and we'll, we'll just uh, start with that. Okay, I'm gonna share. You should be all be able to see this now. Uh, so next month, uh, we have um, our second digital only uh, exhibition uh, opening. It's Mapping the Islamic World. It's the Ottoman, Safavid and Mughal empires. And uh, it, it's on March 26th. It's, by, uh, it's curated by one of our PhD students here at Stanford University. Um, uh, Alexandra Brown Hijazi, and we're really looking forward to that. Um, it starts at 2.45 in the afternoon and uh, opens at 2.45 and the talk will be at three o'clock. Uh, now, just as we did back in November when we did our first all digital uh, exhibition, we uh, will be uh, um, create, we are, we're creating a, a keepsake, um, uh, an interactive keepsake and the first 300 people who will sign up uh, and attend, uh, will get a copy of the keepsake. So in this world of, uh, you know, pixels, uh, it's really nice to actually physically uh, handle something. I know I'm, I'm really um, itching to look at touch maps, you know, the tactile nature of the touch maps, look at them, you know, touch them, smell them, feel them, that sort of thing. So um, it's coming out really well. And so we're really looking forward to that. Um, uh, what's gonna happen, um, um, in, in April, uh, uh, the, the last week of uh, April, uh, actually the second last week of April, um, uh, the, the 23rd, we're going to have another event um, uh, and that is, uh, we're, we're, we're preparing something special. It's our fifth anniversary. And uh, uh, so it's gonna be on the 23rd of April. Again, it'll be in the afternoon and uh, just, just stick on and stay on um, with our newsletters and you'll hear, hear of that. And um, that's, that's what I have uh, for now. Um, I will, um, uh, we, I'll send you links to join the mailing list. We send a newsletter once a month and then um, you will get reminders like you got one for today and um, that's how you, you'll be, you know, how, what's coming down the pike for us. So um, I am going to stop the share right now, but I just wanted to make sure that you, you knew of uh, what's, uh, what's coming down. Uh, so on to the introductions today. Um, first, uh, Steve Pine. 
Uh, Steve Pine is an emeritus uh, professor at Arizona State University. Uh, in a former life, he was a member of the North Rim Long Shorts Fire Crew for 15 seasons and a crew boss for 12. So um, it's a real honor uh, for us here at the center and I really, for all of us, I think, to have a firefighter in our midst and, um, uh, and getting that unique perspective of actually being on the ground and now just basically being a scholar and written several books on this. Uh, we're, I think it's fantastic uh, that, that we have him. Um, he's written fire histories for the United States, Australia, Canada, Europe, including Russia, and uh, you know, the globe or overall. Other books deal with exploration. Uh, most recently, The Great Ages of Discovery, How Western Civilization Learned About a Wider World. So looking forward to Steve's talk. Um, as you know, this is a mini symposium. Steve is going to do sort of a more broad overview of fire um, and, uh, and um, you know, fighting it and the kinds of things, uh, you know, it's really history. Um, and then uh, we'll next have uh, Dr. Gray Brechen. Now he, he's a historical geographer. He is the author of Imperial San Francisco. He's a frequent radio and television guest and a popular public speaker. He's currently, uh, currently a visiting scholar in the uh, University of California, Berkeley Department of Geography. And he's founder and a uh, project scholar of the Living New Deal. Um, uh, he is, uh, he wrote a really great article on um, the uh, Ponderosa Firebreak and that got me thinking and a few others, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, getting, uh, you know, getting someone to speak here and really he's kind of the expert on that. So we're really looking forward to that. And uh, so I think, you know, um, um, Without further ado, just let's just get started on, on the speakers. Um, uh, Steve, uh, first, he's, he's the fire historian and a pyromantic, and he'll speak first and talk about a billion burnable acres, America between three fires. And so take it away, Steve, um, just share your screen and your PowerPoint and we should be going. Well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Um, as you mentioned, I'm really a historian, and so this has been uh, a fun challenge to try to think about uh, telling the story with maps. So let's start with this one, one of my favorites. This is actually a map of forest fires that was produced by the 1880 census, and the darker uh, the coloration, uh, the higher percentage of land burned. Uh, rather a different geography of fire than we're accustomed to today. Um, that map really, in many ways, uh, the United States was at that time much like Brazil in recent years with the same kind of mix of fires. So actually there were, and the map doesn't include uh, grassland fires, desert fires, or others. It was defined as forest fires. So there were three kinds of fires that are integrated here. One are the fires set by lightning, natural fires. The second are all the fires set by people, and mostly that's what this map contains, uh, fires for agriculture and pastoralism. And a third fire that's coming into greater prominence, um, fires burning um, fossil fuels. And I like this Courier and Ives print because it shows uh, that, that new kind of fire dividing the world between burned and unburned. And I'll, we'll, we'll follow up on this later with some, with some maps. So lightning fires, where are they? Well, here's uh, the distribution of lightning fires uh, in the United States. These are forest fires. Uh, you can see, I'm happy to say where I live uh, in the Southwest is the epicenter for it. Uh, there's an interesting epicenter also in Florida, which has always been um, a strange place. And it's interesting that this does not correspond very closely with lightning flashes. Uh, there's a tendency to say the more lightning, you're going to have more lightning fires. It doesn't work out that way. Uh, the spark has to interact uh, with all kinds of other conditions in the same way that more people doesn't mean more fires. So if we look at a recent uh, compilation of all fires in the U.S., human and lightning, this is what we get. We can see that there are far more human caused fires than lightning caused fires, and they occur generally at different times of the year. So let's move on to the people. Um, 
we know that Native Americans burned uh, differently in different locations. Um, very few maps of it. This is one. This is a, a map of Utah. I'm sor sorry, it's partly cropped. It was produced in 1878 by John Wesley Powell's survey. And uh, all of that brownish area is a uh, fire burned area. So they were mapping desert white, irrigable land, green, blue forest, because that would be the source of the water for the irrigable lands, but all the area in between from the edge of the deserts up to uh, the edges of the high plateaus was burned. And Powell's very clear that this was uh, very largely the result of uh, native peoples burning. Um, and noted that removing those peoples would reduce the fires. He later reversed himself in a way and suggested that this kind of Indian burning was actually advantageous, which got him into all kinds of problems uh, with foresters later. But that's probably our earliest map of forest fires that I know. Uh, it's hard to find good agricultural fire maps. Uh, I don't have one for the US. This is the closest I can find is Halifax of all places. And you can see uh, the pink areas, uh, solid and, and uh, stippled, uh, lines of fire, fields of fire, very, very typical. The two photos are from Wisconsin. Uh, and so you'll have to just sort of reconcile the two. Uh, mostly areas of travel burned, uh, fields burned, uh, pasture burned, and blueberries burned. And you get a very interesting geography of fire. And what about this guy? Well, in 1880, that's what the railway network looked like, carrying a new kind of fire and interacting with all of the other kinds of fires in ways that we still don't really uh, appreciate and understand. And closest map I can find 1890 of coal sources, this is where the stuff is coming from. So we'll see how this plays out. Uh, in the post-Civil War period, the interaction of railroads opening up new lands to logging and land clearing produced scenes like these. This was sort of the America's equivalent of the Amazon Highway. Uh, this is actually in Michigan. Uh, and you can see the debris left behind. They only took the uh, uh, prime um, trunks, left everything else, this enormous slash pile, extremely volatile. And of course, it was burned. Uh, so we had megafires, decades of megafires, much larger and more lethal than what we've seen in recent years. And this was the combination. The railroads also were notorious for throwing sparks all, with abandon to all sides. Uh, the first of the famous fires of this era occurred in 1871, October 8. This is why October 8 remains uh, National Fire Prevention Day. It was a million plus acres. Um, uh, around Green Bay, uh, actually able to reconstruct the uh, weather system, uh, a, a dry cold front passing through the region, and uh, a town of Peshtigo and surrounding small communities, mostly made out of wood, the logging communities, um, were uh, incinerated. That made uh, a, lo a lot of interest in this. Uh, Harper's Weekly recorded lots of stuff, and there were photographs in the aftermath. At the same time, in fact, the same day, Chicago burned. And one reason Peshtigo became known is because it was tied to the Great Fire of Chicago and mapping the pattern of the uh, fires spreading through Chicago. It's exactly the same pattern as we see in the forest. Well, the city was basically a reconstituted forest. It behaved in the same way. A lot of areas that we don't think of as fire prone uh, were as a result of this combination. You don't need four years of drought. You, you can do it with you know, 20 feet of, of slash and uh, four weeks of, of dry weather. Here's the Adirondacks in 1903, about 600,000 acres burned, mostly along uh, railway lines, which would then detonate these large slash piles. Um, the trains were used to bring in firefighters, although uh, in several instances, they are setting more fires as they're bringing people in uh, than they're uh, able to put out. And then a large fraction of the Northeast burned again in 1908. Our first professional forester, a German, uh, uh, Bernard Furno, dismissed the whole scene as one of bad habits and loose morals. Uh, like most Central Europeans, he regarded fire as a problem of social behavior, social order. It didn't uh, understand that there may have been um, 
ecological reasons for fire. Uh, but in 1891, as an effort to intervene in this kind of wreckage, um, the Forest Reserve Act was passed, which allowed the president to set aside forest reserves uh, from the public domain. And that eventually led to today's expansive uh, system of national forests and grasslands. How to manage those lands, it wasn't clear. Uh, lots of experiments all over the country from states, uh, from um, uh, small holdings in fe federal lands and national parks uh, relied on the cavalry. Uh, so there, and there were some uh, private associations, but eventually the task fell to foresters. Um, and so an organic act was passed in 1897 to suggest what the goals of these reserves should be. And the next year, Gifford Pinchot, our first native born forester, uh, likened the question of forest fires to that of slavery. And sooner or later, we would have to face up uh, possibly an enormous cost. What, what an astonishing uh, statement to make. Uh, but that was the sense of the time. Interestingly, Pinchot, when he said that, was actually in southern New Jersey, uh, the pine lands of, um, of uh, New Jersey uh, remain today a very volatile area. In 1905, Pinchot became head of the U.S. Forest Service and the national forests were transferred to that agency's jurisdiction. And that really begins our modern era of wildland fire. Uh, this was a global project. It was going on in the Northern Rockies and in the central provinces of India. Here we have our hilltop forester on the right, uh, looking for jungle fires as they were called, and then a big drum to send the word out to others, uh, that villagers to help put it out. Although the problem was the villagers were almost certainly this, the people who said it and had no interest in putting it out. And if you're a fan of Kipling, uh, you may wonder what happens to Mowgli after he grows up. Well, Kipling wrote a short story sequel, and it turns out that Kipling, uh, that uh, Mowgli joins the Indian Forest Service and becomes uh, a forest guard, uh, one of whose primary duties is to fight jungle fires. And I like that because it shows the range of interest across the world in many forms. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey was then brought in to uh, survey and map uh, these, these reserves. And this is a sample. This is from the Bitterroot Reserve uh, along the Idaho-Montana border. And all of that brownish areas of various uh, intensities are burned areas. So they produced fairly extensive maps. And the amount of burning that went on is, is pretty uh, remarkable. Uh, the creation story, though, for the modern way of firefighting begins here uh, in August 1910, what became known as the Big Blowup. Uh, about three and a quarter million acres burned in the northern Rockies. Uh, lots of stories. 78 firefighters were killed in six different incidents uh, as, the, as the storm front passed through and a firestorm flared. This is a mine added outside Wallace, Idaho, where uh, Ed Pulaski, a ranger, held his crew at gunpoint while the firestorm raged outside. After the fires, uh, the uh, Forest Service commissioned a cartographer, a geographer to produce maps, the burned area, and that's what it looks like. This is the area of the big blow up itself. Uh, some of the largest ones followed uh, rail lines, not surprisingly. And they also mapped, interestingly enough, the smoke and the different characteristics of the smoke as it moved across the countryside. So a lot of things that we're concerned with today were, were still on people's minds a century ago, as well as a debate. Uh, this is a, these are a couple of photos to illustrate what became known as light burning. And in August, 1910, the same month as the big blow up in California, a controversy flared up that said the forest service and this kind of paramilitary approach to fire was wrong that we should be emulating the American Indian and routinely burning, underburning these landscapes. And these are samples. The upper right is in the Black Hills. Uh, the larger uh, photo is actually from the Plumas National Forest in Northern California, probably not far from Paradise. Uh, so this was a direct challenge to the agency and it would take about 20, uh, take about another 15 years before it was finally beaten down and in some ways continues with us today. Whoops, I'm sorry. Where did that come from? 
There we go. Uh, and here, here's Anto Leopold, the prophet of modern environmentalism, uh, then a ranger with the Forest Service, 1920, talking about the threat that light burning posed to the Forest Service and its entire program. Uh, again, the sense in which all, the number of bad fires and abusive burning completely overwhelmed people's ability to appreciate the value of good fire. So the, the sense grew up after 1910 that the agency would double down and it would never happen again. The next three chiefs of the Forest Service were all personally on the fire line in 1910. And so this entire generation is a, in a way branded. It's a kind of long march or valley forge for them. And not until 1930, after 1939, would they begin to consider uh, any other option. Congress packs, passes the Weeks Act a year later, which allowed for federal state cooperation in fire protection and forestry and set up the basis for a national infrastructure uh, for fire. So for the next 50 years, the Forest Service uh, pretty much establishes policy, controls suppression, is pretty much a hegemon. Uh, it is the, the agency that links everything else. And then uh, by then in the 1960s, the consequences of that policy are becoming more apparent. And we have, uh, we enter a period, having, having spent 50 years trying to take out all fires, we now spend 50 years trying to put good fires back in. And that leaves us with uh, the current situation, which I'll describe a little later. But amazing numbers of technological innovations, determination brought to bear uh, to attack fires in all forms, including uh, use of World War I planes after the war. But still, there's only so much you can do. There are very few people. There's a lot of land, a lot of undeveloped backcountry. What do you do with these really large fires that boiled up in the early 30s? This was forestry's equivalent to the Dust Bowl and uh, these great clouds of, of uh, dust squalls. And what about all that land that had been cut over and burned and abandoned, which is sort of remote in time? The solution will be um, the New Deal and specifically the Civilian Conservation Corps. And Gray will speak uh, more on this later. Uh, and here's the CCC camps, uh, just organized really, and being sent to that large fire in the background, the Tillamook Burn in, in Oregon. The next year, 1934, big fires in the Northern Rockies. And here, the Chief Forester Gus Silcox had been the number two man in the firefight in 1910. Uh, here it is happening again. Uh, so he calls a meeting in Missoula, all the best minds, and they try to debate what can they do. But now they have resources that they never had available before. And for a variety of reasons, they decide to double down on fire. What became known as the Forester's Policy or Control by 10 o'clock, the 10 a.m. policy, a universal standard for all fires everywhere. Um, and that would remain the law of the land, if you will, uh, for many decades. Partly to meet that, specialized crews are developed. By 1939, we have smoke jumpers, that is smoke chasers who jump out of airplanes with parachutes. And the 40-man crew has developed the forerunner of uh, modern hotshot crew. And we have enormous infrastructure projects. And again, Gray will speak of one of the most dramatic for fire, but a very large fraction of what the CCC did was for pre-suppression or actual firefighting. Uh, in, in a sense, that the means became so large that they determined the ends to which they might be put. And uh, I'll let Gray speak about that. And then as the war begins to approach, uh, even before that, Roosevelt is uh, keenly interested in forestry. Uh, and here he is overseeing a new uh, patriotic uh, poster campaign uh, to fight fires. And you'll notice the Uncle Sam figure looks remarkably like the person standing next to it who is in fact the artist, James Montgomery Flagg, who modeled Uncle Sam on himself. And before long, we're in a war. It is in many ways a fire war. Uh, the US was attacked by fire balloons from Japan. And of course the war ends with a new fire weapon, uh, the atomic bomb. Um, and this is a famous photo, uh, army photo of the Hiroshima atomic strike. This is not however, a photo of the mushroom cloud. This is a photo of the pyrocumulus cloud that developed from the burning city that followed. So that was an enormous exercise in slash and burn. 
and the maps of, of the destruction. Deeply impressed uh, military thinkers uh, with the power of fire as a destructive weapon and the belief that the next war might very well be a fire war. Well, after uh, the war in, in Korea, uh, lots of war surplus equipment became available and in effect replaces the CCC. These are staged photos in Northern and Southern California. You can see almost overnight, firefighting mechanizes, uh, fire is identified as the other red menace. And in a sense, we enter a cold war on fire. We mobilize technology and science, much on the wartime example, uh, to see how we can apply that kind of knowledge uh, to fight fires. And we have scenes like these, B-17s dropping retardant and hotshot crews marching along what looks like a war zone. Even Hollywood joins in. Uh, movies like Red Skies of Montana, probably the best of what is a pretty sorry selection of movies, but nonetheless, uh, they are framed as war stories. It can't continue. Uh, the famous comment out of the Vietnam War, it was necessary to destroy the village to save it. Looks like it's being applied to our, our parks and forests uh, in the name of fire protection. So after 50 years, we began seeing a, a breakup of Forest Service hegemony, a breakup of policy and so forth. All this occurs in a backdrop, backdrop of environmental movement. All the federal agencies get new charters what they are supposed to do with the land. That means they need new fire policies. Big change in demography and a civil society for fire develops as well. And what had been a kind of melting pot of public lands is now going to evolve into a kind of special interest mosaic. And those agencies that have particularly special uh, targets will do much better than those that have to integrate many kinds of purposes. And a good example of, of the new uh, state is the Wilderness Act, 1964, which creates a whole special category of fire, of, of land, which will require a very different fire policy. So uh, the fire revolution had two poles, one in Florida, it was all about working landscapes. It was about a lot of it, private land. It was about deliberate burning. California was much more interested in wild landscapes, public lands, natural fire, more interest in using deliberate burning to create the conditions for allowing natural fire to return. In 1962 as well, um, a civil society emerges, private research station outside Tallahassee, Florida, um, creates a series of uh, fire ecology conferences, which really challenge uh, the establishment and in effect uh, overthrow it. And the Nature Conservancy conducted its first prescribed burn in a prairie. So today, the uh, Nature Conservancy burns about as much yearly as the National Park Service. So by 1968, the National Park Service converted, renounced the 10 a.m. policy, and went into a program to restore fire. 1978, the Forest Service followed as well. So these are not new, new issues. And the issue is, in many ways, not policy, but application. So prescribed fire, deliberate burning, uh, natural fire, how do we allow more room for nature? The idea of a prescribed natural fire uh, was invented. Don't try to parse the metaphysics there, it doesn't make sense. And then instead of a 10 a.m. policy, there are many options available for responding to a fire. So the revolution is rather quickly done, but then uh, uh, the polarization of the country that has become so pronounced begins uh, with the 1980 elections, um, an effort to roll back many of the environmental and other reforms of the 60s and 70s, and fire will be caught up in that, uh, in that effort. Uh, it's not enough to eliminate the progress, but it is enough to stall it. And in effect, we have a lost decade and then some. Ending with two spectacular fires that will highlight the two extremes, if you will, of the coming uh, fire scene. So in 1988, Yellowstone, about 40% of Yellowstone burned in a series of fires, completely impossible uh, to contain. And in 1991, Oakland burned. Um, you know, the last big urban fire in the United States was in San Francisco in 1906. And seeing cities burn again 
It was like watching polio come back. But Oakland across the bay now defines what will become a fire of sort of urban and wildland mixing. So the Yellowstone fires, uh, these are maps of uh, basically since, since the park uh, became effectively administered. Uh, and you can see the burned area in 1988, modern ones, how much that dominates. Uh, it was under underburned early, and then probably overburned in the last few decades. And then Oakland, um, 795 houses burned in the first hour. Uh, over, uh, I think about 3,600 burned in all, uh, completely unstoppable. So these were, in a sense, two extremes of fire and how they interact will have a lot to do with how we think about things, but they didn't change policy. Um, and the revolution doesn't pick up again until a new change of administration, and especially the 1994 fire at South Canyon that killed uh, 14 firefighters. Uh, it was mapped, uh, and the fire behavior involved, uh, analyzed in detail, but the motivating force was really a book by Norman McLean published two years earlier that described a fire crew that was burned over in 1949. And now uh, the South Canyon fire was seen through that prism and motivated people to get more serious uh, about reform. We have a new federal fire policy in 95, consolidating things. Secretary of the Interior Babbitt declares a national fire crisis. And in 2000, we have two major fires. Uh, one in the Northern, one, a set of fires in the Northern Rockies here 90 years after the big blow up. I mean, all those crews, all those engines, all those airplanes and helicopters, all that science, all the communication, we're no further along in stopping those fires than we were 90 years earlier. And then a prescribed fire, uh, probably ill-conceived, but certainly ill-executed um, in northern uh, New Mexico, escaped and burned into the town of Los Alamos, creating the most expensive fire uh, in American history of this sort. So it seemed we couldn't like... Yeah, it's just that there's more of the same as we get into the new century. Nothing. It's just everything is aggravating. More big fires, more communities burned, more firefighters dying, the term big mega fire is coined. The Forest Service is Congress reform funding. The Forest Service is now spending over half its budget simply on firefighting, not doing anything else. So I think we have, uh, speaking as a historian, a relatively nice period here, sort of the, the fire revolution period. Uh, and I think that that has faded and now we're into something different. Um, so let's go back to maps. We wanted maps. This is what the fire scene looked like in 1980. Uh, the USGS mapped large fires from 1980 to 2003. That's what it looks like, a very different uh, distribution. Mostly this is a map of public lands because private lands have taken fire out. Uh, and that's a result of our sort of the whole industrial process. But in 2012, this is what NASA's view of the fire scene in the US look like. Again, a rather different view. Most of that red is uh, deliberate burning, a lot of it for agriculture. Um, and the, the yellow are mostly the uh, wildfires. And with satellite image, we can now get global maps of fires um, and begin placing it in a larger context. So what have we got to show for the efforts over the last 50 plus years? Well, natural fire, some places have succeeded. Uh, this is a, an upper basin in Yosemite, almost no fires from 1930 to 72, and then fires allowed to return and creating inter interesting kinds of overlays uh, and, and intermixing. Now, what about prescribed fire? A major move uh, to bring fire back to uh, private lands as well as public. Uh, here's a prescribed fire councils, nationally organized, actually international now, uh, continuing to spread, even arguing for a landowner's right to burn. We're not exactly in Second Amendment territory here, but, but there's a, a certain element of that. Uh, and then efforts to, uh, uh, to tally up how much burning is actually being done, at least by states. And you can see the Southeast is the major center, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, that's, that's almost all 
because of the Flint Hills, uh, which burns annually for uh, pastoral reasons. So efforts going on. And what about efforts to deal with wildfires? Well, Alaska has developed all kinds of mixed approaches uh, when a fire occurs, uh, how to handle it, depending on where it sits on the landscape and what the conditions are. And the other development is what's become known as managed wildfire. This is a San Carlos Apache reservation in Arizona. They've been trying to burn an area for about 10 years uh, along this ridge and the conditions were never quite right. They got two lightning caused fires and managed to push and pull those fires over several weeks and got 84,000 acres out of it and managed to burn at last the area they'd been trying. So a kind of boxing and burning strategy is coming in, which is a very different hybrid, half suppression, half controlled fire. But I keep going back to these uh, extremes here, uh, Biosphere 2, Santa Catalina Mountains in the background, fire uh, inevitable and necessary in the mountains, no fire allowed in Biosphere 2, zero, none. Um, two different models of the world and our relationship to fire within them. So we're reaching the point where we're accepting fire in wilderness as a part of a natural scene, but certainly not willing to tolerate any in our built environment. But what, we, what I see in all of this is that as in so much of American life these days, there's no middle. There's no middle image. There's no middle narrative uh, to, to go along with it. So we polarized our fire scene, one side dealing with towns mm -hmm. and uh, how they burn with the surrounding countryside and one with the countryside. So here, percentage of of uh, private forest experiencing increased housing density. This is how we're moving our houses into zones, many of which will be fire, and we're classifying those fire risks. California has probably gone further than others. Um, but as we look at that, I, I, I put in the aerial photo of the uh, town burned because uh, while all the structures are gone, the tree has survived. It's not the case that you have vegetation. Uh, the trees that were burned were burned because they were too close to houses. Um, they're adapted to fire, the communities were not. And what about the countryside? Ex extensive mapping going on, uh, very detailed, high intensity GIS, uh, trying to classify fire regimes, how, what is the pattern of fire? And then to use that to uh, estimate how far out of sync we are today and where we might want to put remediation. Um, and so we have some large scale landscape restoration acts uh, underway. Uh, the problem is that none of them is at the scale or pace we need. So let me expand this a little bit further. I'm sure you're interested in climate change, but let me, let me go back rather than just climate change into the role of burning fossil fuels or what I think of as lithic landscapes. Here's our, our satellite map of burning living landscapes. And here's a map of CO2 emissions, primarily a map of um, lithic landscapes burning, fossil fuels. And if you look at it at finer grain, you see that they are inverses. Where you have one, you don't have the other. Uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon. This has nothing to do with climate change. This is apart from climate change. When people started burning fossil fuels, it changed our whole relationship to fire on the land. Satellite images, earth at night, uh, two realms. We see this over and over. Sub-Sahara Africa, largely burning living landscapes. Uh, Europe and parts north, not. Now, not all of those lights are powered by uh, fossil fuels, but a large fraction are, and the rest are uh, the products of a fossil fuel society. Extreme examples, uh, North Korea, uh, sort of the dark side, conspicuous by the absence of light, but if you look at the satellite images during the day of hotspots, that's what you get. So the political entity of North Korea is almost completely contained. The fires are completely contained that, which has to do with how these two realms interact. And so my final map will be, let's, let's step back even farther and see uh, where fire sits on the land today and this point include climate change as a result. So the Pleistocene was about two and a half million years. 
uh, driven by these Milankovitch cycles and so forth. We have lots of ice-informed landscapes, lots of periglacial landscapes, permafrost, lakes, all kinds of other outwashed uh, plains and so forth, uh, drop in sea levels. Um, about 90% of the last million years has been glacial. We've been in a short interglacial mass extinctions. And of course, this is the era of hominids. The only creatures we know who manipulate fire, only one of us is left. We now have a monopoly over it. And here are a picture of some erect beans bringing, bringing fuel to the fire, which is what people did. We found more things to burn. But our burning has now gone on so long, and with fossil fuels, it's gone on afterburns, that we're creating really a kind of alternative era, a fire age, with fire informed biotas driving out the last of the ice and the ice age creatures, all kinds of uh, collateral uh, landscapes. Uh, maybe these large smoke piles are the equivalent of outwash plains, a rise in sea level, another mass extinction. And here we have people, this is uh, the uh, Fort McMurray fire in Canada, uh, fleeing <laughs> from the fires uh, they have created. Fort McMurray was set up to uh, mine tar sands, uh, a, a rather uh, dirty fossil fuel, uh, but it's also in the middle of the boreal bush. And now they're leaving, driven out how? In, in their gas powered cars. So I think we're going from a fire crisis to a fire epoch or what I've taken to calling uh, a pyrocene. So if we were to put all of these things together, all these various maps into a kind of scatter diagram, what I've tried to do is to uh, draw a regression line. I think it was a national narrative through them. And thank you for the opportunity to, to try that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Greg. Steve, thank you so very much. That was fascinating. And uh, already there are several questions. Um, I, I personally have a couple, so I'm looking forward to, forward to that. Uh, I, I appreciate very much uh, in you incorporating maps. Uh, we are a little bit map crazy, map nerdy group here. So uh, really appreciate that part. Um, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, at this point, um, what we'll do is, um, you know, ha uh, I'll just kind of uh, say just quickly, uh, Gray, uh, Brechen will speak next. Uh, he's, you're gonna be very specific. Uh, you're gonna talk about uh, Ponderosa Way. Um, and uh, we, your talk is entitled, his talk is entitled Ponderosa Way, Rediscovering the World's Longest and Most Forgotten Firebreak in California. So take it away, uh, Gray, just, uh, uh, Share your screen and then we should be, we should be good to go. Great. Um, let's see. Wonderful. Okay. Yes. Good. All right. Um, well, it's a wonderful honor to be here at the Rumsey Map Center as a map lover myself and a certified geographer. Um, so I thought that I would just start out for a moment just talking about my day job. And that is as the project scholar for the Living New Deal, which is based at the Department of Geography at UC Berkeley, the rival campus just to the north of Stanford. And um, what we are is a national team effort to, for the first time, to identify, map, and interpret the total physical legacy left to us by the New Deal, by the various alphabet soup agencies of the New Deal, about which I will just talk about one today. Um, there's our website. Um, what we're doing is uncovering a lost civilization, which just happens to be ours. My parents' generation built it about 85 years ago. They were not really aware of how enormous it was or what its significance was, and we're digging it up because it's been very largely forgotten and especially the, um, the uh, extraordinary artifact that I'm going to be talking about later on. Um, this was our map um, several years ago, um, which was getting a bit clunky because the dots, each of which uh, represents a public work, 
um, they were burying the United States, so we made them a little bit smaller. The nation was transformed in just eight years, and this is what it looks like today. Um, they're color-coded, and you can go to anyone and open it up and find out what was done in that era live or where you're traveling. We now have a phone app as well, too. Um, and uh, to 16,500 um, sites. That seems like a lot, and it looks like a lot on the map, but in fact, we're just scratching the surface because we, from our enormous data backlog, that we've got hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions to go. Um, I see that I'm, um, my connection is a little unstable. Um, Salim, should I just, well, I'll, I'll go on and see if we have any trouble. I just keep going on. Okay. I think you're okay. There's a little drop well, in audio, but I think it's fine right now. So just keep going. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, one of the agencies which less, left us a lot of stuff is the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, as you can see, it lasted for about um, 10 years. It was Franklin Roosevelt's own idea. Um, and it was the most popular of all of the New Deal agencies. Um, these are some of the almost 3 million young men, well, more than 3 million actually, that passed through it, working and having fun, and they did a lot of both. Um, and these are, are actually archival photographs from the FDR library at Hyde Park. Um, each one of the camps uh, had about 200 men in it. Uh, they lived in these wooden barracks and um, they would have an infirmary, a school, library, sports facilities, of course, a mess hall, and then the barracks themselves where the men slept. And then they would go out uh, and work from these camps, um, sometimes way out into the woods, which were called spike camps, but these were the main camps. These are the camps just six months after it was created in April of 1933. At this point, there were about a thousand camps. At the peak, a few years later, there would be over 4,000 camps. But it's interesting to look at this map because you can see where the camps largely are. There, there are a lot of them in the Sierra Nevada. There are a lot up in the Cascades and quite a bit in the Adirondacks and northern Pennsylvania. And interestingly enough, also in New England, um, there would be a lot more later on. Now, contrary to popular mythology, in fact, the uh, CCC was at least partially integrated right from the get-go outside of the South, as a photograph like this or this one shows. It was segregated halfway through, largely because its director, Robert Fechner, was a Southerner and never approved of this um, integration. But bear in mind that this was done 15 years before Truman integrated the armed forces. And so... Uh, this would have been a bit controversial at the time. They left behind an enormous legacy of stuff that we see in our national and state parks, beautiful buildings, structures. Uh, that was Sequoia National Park. Um, this is stonework. It's actually a forest um, station in Salem, Oregon. They did beautiful stonework, which made them very proud. Um, to show their families later on. This is Bandelier National Monument. Um, those buildings are actually built with the rhyolite that was actually carved out of the canyon walls um, when, it's, uh, when it's young, actually. It's soft enough to carve, and they would construct these buildings with it. And then they did a lot of archaeology as well, too. They were trained to do that and building uh, preservation and reconstruction. This is uh, Mission Purissima Concepcion at Lompoc in Central California. It had been ruined by um, a big earthquake in 1812, and they reconstructed this entire mission. And you can actually see them doing it with the adobe bricks that they made here in archival photographs, or you can go and visit it. They also did uh, beautiful amphitheaters. This is Red Rock, just east, uh, excuse me, west of Denver, and this is Mountain theater up near the summit of Mount Tamalpais State Park, where they did many of the uh, trails and other improvements in the state park. They planted over 3 billion trees, um, and uh, I'll come back to that later on, but they also fought forest fires. A great deal of their time actually was spent 
fighting fires, but also preventing them, and then recovering afterwards, such as planting trees in the burn areas after the fires had gone over them. Now, the reason, of course, that the CCC existed at all was because of the Great Depression. This is one of the FSA photographs of a young man in a pose of despair at the time. Uh, the unemployment rate at that time officially was 25%, but for young people, it was even higher, and for African Americans, higher still. So um, somebody at the time said, I have moments of real terror when I think we might be losing this generation. We have got to bring these young people into the active life of the community and make, and, uh, make sure that they are necessary and see that they are necessary. Um, and uh, that person, of course, was Eleanor Roosevelt. And that's one of the reasons that um, we have the CCC, which, as I said, was her husband's own idea. Today, you can see those same attitudes of despair in all of our cities, even in rural areas as well, too. And what, what we now have is personalized depression, or what you might actually call wasted potential, which could actually be used as it was used 85 years ago, but we don't have a program to do that, but we might soon. Uh, this is Eleanor Roosevelt actually re uh, reviewing the troops. Uh, they're in their best uh, khaki um, uh, uniforms. And uh, this is actually potential realized. And these boys probably felt that they had died and gone to heaven, not just to meet the amazing first lady, but also because they had been stationed at a camp in Yosemite Valley. And so many of these boys would have been from the hollers of Kentucky or from the Dust Bowl. And suddenly they find themselves um, making Yosemite Valley accessible to all of us. We all use CCC stuff when we go to Yosemite or any of the other national parks. This is one of the CCC boys, Walter Atwood, who recently passed away. He was nearing 100. And Walter was for many years the president of the CCC Veterans Organization. And like so many of the vets, uh, he said that those were the happiest years of his life and it set him up for success later on in life. Uh, this is actually in Santa Fe. He's leaning his hand on one of the statues, which we call Iron John, which our sister organization, the National New Deal Preservation Association, hopes to have at least one in every state to honor the men who so large have been forgotten, who left so much for us. Now, if you, if you wanna see the CCC boys in action, actually, we have over a hundred New Deal movies posted on the Living New Deal website. You can go and you can actually see some of that. And uh, so just, uh, you know, set yourself down, get some popcorn and um, see the boys in action. Well, finally, to the Ponderosa Way, um, I first heard about this when I was up in Nevada City and my friend, a ranger at that time, uh, Jordan Fisher Smith, told me that there was this fire break, an 800 mile fire break, very close to Nevada City. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. It was done by the CCC. So I tucked that in the back of, the mind, of my mind. And then on November 8th, 2018, the campfire happened, or at least it began. And it wiped out the town of Paradise, as you all know, and the adjacent town of Megalia. And um, so it was a horrendous catastrophe, one of the greatest in American history. This is a satellite view looking down at it as it's consuming Paradise. And you can see the spot fires out front of it. Uh, the smoke is, is headed west into the Sacramento Valley. Chico is off in the upper left to give you an idea of where this is all happening. The, the um, topography is quite rugged up there. And in this fire, at least 85 people died and it cost $16.5 billion. And of course it bankrupted PG&E, which was found guilty of starting the fire. This is an article in the Chico Enterprise Record um, just, just um, a year afterwards, and it looks like a blowtorch has gone over the land. And you can see how, how rugged it is uh, because paradise is up on those ridges. Well, what I found out was the Ponderosa Way ran right through Megalia and Paradise. Um, and um, here it is. This is actually from a journal at the time. You can see it um, with the snow actually outlining it as it comes down this ridge. And I found that 
almost nobody knew about the Ponderosa Way. Um, I thought that was very interesting because it was a huge civil, civil work. So my friend Carol Denny actually did a cartoon of it for the, um, a paper in Berkeley uh, about how the, we had this kind of amnesia about this enormous um, civil work. It would be as if you built something like this and then you neglected it and let it be mined for bricks and then just forgot that it had ever happened. Um, this is another project that the CCC boys did. In this case, it was addition. They planted um, rows of trees to act as shelter belts to anchor the soil in the dust belt and north of that. But the, um, but the Ponderosa Way was actually subtraction. These were the CCC boys actually uh, subtracting from the landscape, the brush and the trees to create this enormous um, fuel break, which was the sort of antonym of the shelter built breaks that they were building in other parts of the country. Well, um, I wrote an article about this and an op-ed and I shopped it around. I couldn't get the Chronicle to publish it. I couldn't get any other papers to do it last summer. Um, and I thought that was um, strange because people should know about this. So I actually contacted several of the reporters who were doing really great reporting on the fires last summer. And one of them, Matthias Gaffney at the Chronicle, um, picked up the story and ran with it. And on November 15th, Sunday paper, this front page story appeared um, with a double uh, jump spread on the inside. And it really um, is terrific. I think it deserves a Pulitzer uh, because, um, people then began becoming aware that we once had this fire break and that perhaps we should have been better at maintaining it. It comes with a lot of great graphics. Um, I actually recommend that you go to the digital version because uh, the print version didn't have enough room for all the stuff that you'll find digitally. Uh, this is a simple map that just shows, again, the, the extent of the Ponderosa Way, running the length of the Sierra Nevada. This is a more detailed map, and it shows that the Ponderosa Way actually runs through, I believe it's 16 different California counties, which could be a nightmare as far as jurisdiction goes. I'll come back to that later on. Also, there was a letter about the efficacy of the uh, New Deal, of the um, the Ponderosa Way, which was, uh, I believe, from the California State Archives. Well, the photograph on the left is actually from Stephen's collection, and it shows the Ponderosa Way on the ground. And what you can see is that it wasn't actually in the timber. It goes through the brushy area of the lower foothills, the kind of chaparral area, which really gets dry in the summer where fires can start and then climb up the ridges and invade the um, the uh, forest up above, in this case, Ponderosa Pine Forest, which gives it its name. The um, Chronicle article is from 1933, and it shows that uh, the state was actually um, um, fighting for more CCC camps to build this fire break right at the very beginning in 1933, because it was a rival with other states that also wanted CCC camps at that time to do various other kinds of work. Let's look at some newspaper clippings. Um, I wanna show you just how fast the boys created this uh, remarkable uh, fuel break or fire break. Um, this is just about a year after the CCC was formed and it's 65% complete. Uh, the boys worked under terrible conditions, especially in the summer. Remember this is pre sunblock and they worked without shirts. So they suffered terrible um, sunburn, but also poison oak because they had to cut the break through poison oak groves and, and the boys just really suffered because of that. Um, this is about a year and a half after they started and there it, it shows you that they actually worked all seasons. They worked into the winter. And about two years later, um, the, fire, the, the fire break was nearly complete. This is an article um, that says, that it actually was very efficacious in fighting fires. Of 11 big fires, uh, it stopped nine of them. And the two that it couldn't stop were um, wind-driven uh, fires, much like we have today. They didn't just build the fire break, they built fire towers 
and communication lines, telephone lines between them uh, so that uh, the uh, crews uh, could keep abreast of the movement of these various fires. And they also created recreation areas because the Ponderosa Way provided access to areas that had been largely inaccessible before. And I think many of these campgrounds are still in operation, but they also provided access for people who might want to move into the Sierra foothills too. I'll come back to that later on. The preferred route of the Ponderosa Way was along the ridges, um, but that's impossible in the Sierra foothills because it's deeply dissected with rivers and creeks. So here's a photograph uh, from uh, one of the journals at the time showing the Ponderosa Way coming down and splitting for reasons I don't know, but coming down to one of these river canyons where they would build a bridge across it uh, so that it could be continued for fire trucks and others. And then it would climb the adjacent ridge and continue on the next ridge if there was a ridge there. So you can see that it was really rough territory that they were going through. As I said, they preferred to build the Ponderos way along the ridges. And um, this is the ideal situation, a rather flat area where they could build a road for the fire trucks and then clear a zone on either side. So in rougher terrain, the Ponderos way would be about 50 feet wide. On an area like this, it could expand out to about 200 to 250 feet. Um, and that would be a very effective fire break at that point. Whenever possible, they would actually take it right down to the mineral soil because this would make it much easier to maintain the fire break because obviously the shrubs and the trees could not reestablish themselves quickly um, on a kind of fuel break like that. Well, then the war comes along and what happens then? In 1942, the CCC is essentially put out of existence, the boys, by that time, really hardened by the work that they had done, were sent off to fight uh, in the war, and the army took over the Ponderosa Way, and uh, they actually maintained it as a last line of defense in case the Japanese ever invaded the West Coast. So they actually apparently strengthened it, especially the bridges, because they had to accommodate tanks for the defense of everything to the east of the Sierra Nevada. But after the war, there was no CCC anymore. Uh, Roosevelt wanted to make it permanent, but it never was, unfortunately. And it fell victim to interagency rivalries and um, essentially nobody wanted it. It became a kind of an orphan because it would be expensive to maintain and it went through so many different jurisdictions. So it was allowed to decay. This is actually a stretch of it in Mariposa County about midway. Uh, up the, the uh, Ponderosa Way, um, and you can barely drive on it at this point. American Forests wrote in 1934, bitter experience has shown that without an organization far beyond anything that can be expected in the near future, many of the brush fires are going to get large. Such fires will not only result in damage to the watershed and rangeland upon which they originate, but also unless the Ponderosa Way is there to act as a barrier, will culminate in much more measurable, spectacular, and irremediable damage to the timber belt above. Well, two words were never spoken than that. Uh, what they didn't foresee was the urbanization of the foothills, because of course, um, if the Ponderosa Way is not there or not maintained, uh, these fires could actually burn into cities rather than the valuable timber belt that, they were that it was designed to protect. So the bridges were um, in many cases allowed to just decay, such as this one. Um, and then um, I finally give you a granular map. This is the only one I've ever been able to discover. And that's because it was done by geography professor Betty Elaine Smith's class as a cartography assignment in, I believe it was 2010, but she published a paper in 2011. And in that paper, this is about a 57 mile stretch of the Ponderosa Way up in Butte and Tehama County, uh, just north of where Paradise and Chico are up in the Sierra foothills in very rugged territory that I believe it goes into the Ishii wilderness. And in her paper, 
He said, there is a surprising lack of published information and local knowledge regarding this historic fire break and transportation route. It seems that some segments of Ponderosa Way became dirt, gravel, or paved roads. Some segments are known today by a different name, while other sections are trails or simply do not exist. Some creeks are crossed by substantial steel bridges, while the route simply stops at the brink of other creeks or canyons. Take note, geographers, this is an ideal project for geographers to, to map and conduct field work to find answers to these puzzling questions. So um, Betty's class did 57 miles, about um, over 700 miles remain to be mapped. Uh, so um, I should say this is a, an assignment for cartographers to do for their students. This is Doug Laurie. This is a photograph from um, Matthias Gaffney's article in the Chronicle. Here's a close up of Doug. Doug um, is a retired uh, California Conservation Corps um, supervisor, and he's the kind of gadfly up um, in paradise that I am in my town in Inverness on Point Reyes. Um, he's been lobbying for literally years uh, for some agency to adopt the Ponderosa Way, not only to, to slow fires, but also as an emergency evacuation route. Uh, and this was actually a letter to the editor that he wrote, uh, claiming that somebody had to maintain this fire break or something dreadful would happen. It wasn't just Doug, however, because in 2007, over 10 years before the paradise was wiped out, uh, the Chico Enterprise uh, record actually ran an article about the Ponderosa Way and about the parlous condition of the bridges and other roads that actually would could be used as escape routes. It would be easier to do this kind of research if the state archives was open today because it has files that I lust to get my hands on, but I can't get there. And then the CCC Museum, which used to be maintained down at a um, California Conservation Corps camp near San Luis Obispo, um, was boxed up and put into storage because they couldn't afford to maintain it and disappeared somewhere in San Bernardino. But there's a great deal of information in that CCC Museum. Well, this is the map that I wanna concentrate on. This is actually from a journal article article in 1934, um, because I, I question how were they able to build this immense uh, civil work uh, at that time that they did it. It was supposed to co connect all the um, national forests, but as you can see from this map, um, it actually scarcely touches them. It's down on the uh, lower foothills, and uh, it apparently goes through a great deal of private property. How they did this, I don't know. I think the answers are up there in this, those files in the state archives, but I found one article that said a lot of it was just done with handshakes. Well, that was before the um, Sierra foothills began urbanizing. So I wanna go to this structure because I wondered not just how they built the Ponderosa Way, but how they were able to build vast civil works projects like this on time and on budget. The Bay Bridge was built within just about three years and on budget, and it works. There was no scandal involved. And um, this is just one of many New Deal projects. Think of the TVA, think of the state water project. Um, they were able to do these kinds of things then, and we can't seem to be able to do even minor, finer breaks at this point, as I recently found out. Well. Uh, before I get there, I just want to go to something that seems completely um, um, off the topic, but isn't actually. Uh, in 1905, Daniel Burnham proposed a, an ideal city plan for San Francisco, which involved cutting radial boulevards across the existing 19th century grid plan. The reason for that was three. It would speed traffic, it would beautify the city and make it look like Paris, he thought, but they would also serve as fire breaks just in case a fire ever broke out in a city which is largely made out of wood because of the fear of earthquakes. And wouldn't you know, just a year later, that happened after, a, after the great earthquake, uh, the fire broke out and largely erased San Francisco, exposing its topography. The only buildings that you can actually make out 
are masonry buildings. The one in the, in the middle is the Fairmont Hotel, which was just nearing the completion when it was gutted, when the fire went, went through. But all the other wooden buildings in the neighborhoods uh, have been erased. You would think it would be an ideal time to realize those radio boulevards that Dan Burnham had planned, but uh-uh. Uh, the grid remains, the grid of streets, and the streets aren't just for transportation, they define the property lines, private property, and private property owners were loath to give up their land, their valuable land, for those radio boulevards, so the city was built back just the way it had been, and it remains at least as dangerous, I think, as it was in 1906 when the fire broke out, but that's another lecture. I like to think of fuel breaks as fire levees. Nobody in the right mind would live in a floodplain, say next to the Mississippi River or the Sacramento River, if there wasn't a, a levee there to contain it in case of floods. This is actually collective investment, which you might otherwise refer to as taxes. And uh, they're good things to spend uh, for the community safety, uh, particularly now in the year of climate change, because increasingly insurance companies are either raising uh, uh, premiums or canceling them all together in floodplains because of the increased danger of flooding. And the same is true out in the West in the fire zones. Um, it's getting increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to get fire insurance policies. Well, back to levies, the American Society of Civil Engineers every four years issues its report card on the state of American infrastructure. Um, the levies got a, a D, I think that's a D minus actually, um, uh, because we are not maintaining them. Um, $1.3 trillion in property values is at risk behind the levies. Um, and a lot of that is gonna go because we're not maintaining the levies. Um, the, um, the cumulative grade for America's infrastructure is D plus. And that's because we chose not to invest in its maintenance, let alone its expansion. Um, I went through all the different categories and fire breaks are not mentioned. They didn't apparently consider that. If they did, I'm sure they would probably be down with levies themselves, probably with a D or maybe even a D minus because many of them have simply disappeared like the Ponderosa way. Well, you might remember that our forest chief um, uh, met with the two California governors in the ruins of paradise. He had forgotten where he was actually uh, by misplacing the, the town that he was at. And he lectured them uh, that the uh, responsibility for the fire was theirs because they hadn't maintained the forest. They hadn't, for example, raked it like, as he said, the Finns do. They had a lot of fun with that. Um, but in fact, actually, he was at least half correct. But I think, I know it's presumptuous, but there was a previous president, Roosevelt, who actually knew a great deal more about forests than 45 did. That is because when asked to describe himself, he once said he was a grower of trees. He loved trees. At Hyde Park, he planted half a million trees on his property, and he knew that one had to maintain them. But of course, that's also why he created the Civilian Conservation Corps to do that on a continental scale. The real reason we can't maintain our forest has a great deal to do with this guy, Howard Jarvis, who began the tax revolt in 1978 with Prop 13, stanching the funds that public agencies need to do things like maintain our forests. We just can't afford to do it much anymore. And that has a lot to do with the kind of fires that we have. But it also has to do with this, which ironically largely starts with the New Deal. That is, you can easily drown in red tape, which I recently found when I tried to build a fuel break in my town of Inverness. Um, and uh, it was a bit frustrating, actually. But uh, anybody who tries to do something like that is going to run into this kind of problem. So, I think that what we really need, obviously, and many people agree with me, especially um, Democrats in Congress, is a renewed Civilian Conservation Corps in what Stephen has called the pyro scene. Um, and in fact, I was asking this, but uh, I'm delighted to say in the last month, uh, President Biden has proposed a new Civilian Climate Corps, which would be 
part of a Green New Deal, not only to do what the original CCC did, but actually to um, prevent forest fires and to do th such things as undergrounding utilities and of course, um, solar panels and fire hardening our communities. Uh, we don't have to actually have a federal um, climate core immediately because we already have a CCC, the California Conservation Core, which was established by Jerry Brown the first, is the oldest and largest of all the cores, the state cores, and um, it does its work brilliantly, but so unobtrusively that many Californians aren't even aware it exists. It needs to be greatly expanded to do uh, fuel breaks and to maintain such ones as the Ponderosa Way. Well, we, as you all know, we had a horrendous fire season last year and actually for the two years previous to that. Uh, the papers were just full of it and our lungs were just smoke. But what really surprises me is how quickly people forget about the magnitude of that and the urgency of addressing them if they weren't directly affected and as soon as the smoke clears. Uh, as the, this is a more recent article by the Chronicle, uh, because of the climate change and the drought, uh, California now faces fire weather year round. It's not just California, this is the Rockies, um, which I took taking the Zephyr um, out across the country. Uh, millions of trees are dead in the Rockies because the uh, winter temperatures are much higher than they were. Beetles are attacking, disease, et cetera. And so this is just standing kindling. And that also started igniting last summer when Colorado had similar fires. Well, I'm just gonna wrap up by showing you what happened in Point Reyes or around Point Reyes um, on August 18th, 2020. Um, about two days before that, we had that freak lightning storm, which was terrifying in itself. But a few days later, um, the fires set by that lightning storm began igniting and manifesting themselves. That's the San Andreas Fault off to the left, which we call Tamales Bay out there. But you're looking south, and that's what becomes known as the Woodward Fire, which was ignited in the core of Point Reyes National Seashore, just six miles from the town of Inverness and Point Reyes Station. Uh, we were very lucky with that because we got crack teams in, which contained it to only 5,000 acres. Other areas weren't so lucky. This is a fire arising to the north in Sonoma County, and this is the plume rising from Napa, where there would be more fires in the next month, the great uh, wine country fires. There were fires uh, essentially igniting all over California in the West at that time. And I'm sure that any of you were here remember this horrendous day when it seemed at first that the sun wasn't going to rise and then it did come up and it was everything was orange and the air was toxic. And of course, people were saying it feels like the end of the world. Well, in fact, it did feel that way. And this is the smoke plume actually uh, drifting out over Tamales Bay. I hope that I never see anything like this again, but I know I will, unless we take preventative measures as the Ponderosa Way did and as the CCC did 85 years ago. So thank you very much for your patience and thank you to everybody who helped me to put together this slideshow. Salim? Thank you, Gray. That was fascinating. Uh, Thank you. It's just, uh, yeah, it was. It's just the perfect kind of deep dive uh, that uh, you know, following Steve, that kind of you know really goes into one solution uh, to this problem. And uh, as you as you mentioned, it, you, you've, you've got to tackle it different ways. So this is certainly one way of doing it. Um, I we have several questions for for both of you. So, Gray, if you want to. Uh, unshare your screen, stop uh, sharing that. Uh, that would be good. And then um, and then what we'll do, yeah, you've got one more, yeah. So uh, you're still uh, sharing your screen. Let's see. Yeah, so if you go down to uh, share screen at the bottom. Ah, oh, there, excellent. I see. You're, you're good, there we go. you're good, mm -hmm. excellent. So- um, I'm still new to this. No, no, this is great, this is great. Uh, we. we we, uh, we have several questions um, and um, I think, um, I, think uh, uh, I can kind of make out who they're for. 
Uh, the first one is from uh, David McMillan, and he asks, is the spring surge in human fire caused by clearing and burning? And I think this is for Steve. Yeah, I think it's <clears throat> it has several causes. Um, one is uh, it's a way of protecting land prior to uh, the advent of the major fire season. So uh, it spring fire is, is very common uh, throughout all kinds of economies. So in a kind of hunting and, and gathering society, uh, people would burn early to stimulate the growth that would come later. Um, and that would also protect areas from wildfires that might threaten. And then in agricultural societies, the same thing, uh, mm -hmm. preparing the land for, for the rains to come. Mm -hmm. um, but it, 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 yeah, it's pretty clear. Um, yeah, I don't know, I, I could go into a lot of detail, but, but the spring fire is very, is very common. And then some areas have a, a fall fire. Um, particularly if snow is late and uh, forests have gone into dormancy, they're vulnerable. Got it, got it, got it. okay. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Roy uh, Mies. I, uh, uh, apologies if I'm uh, mispronouncing the name. Uh, he, he asks, how can I get copies of the earliest airplanes used for fire service? I think he means maybe photographs of them, um, especially one like those used by Hap Arnold in the early 1920s? And I think this is again for Steve. Sure. Well, the uh, uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, created a historic photo collection, over half a million photos, and that has since been transferred to the National Archives, and they have a number of them. I actually had one uh, in in one of my slides, but it was it was mixed with a lot of other machines, so you may not you may not have seen it. Uh, and the Hap Arnold connection is quite interesting. Uh, the program aerial fire uh, surveillance. Uh, the the story goes that it, it it happened in a San Francisco bar. The uh, state forester at the time, Kirk Dubois, was lamenting that he had all these fires in remote areas that he couldn't get to, and a guy further down the bar was lamenting that uh, all of his airplanes and pilots were being mothballed uh, after the war. And so they got together and put together uh, several years of, mm -hmm. of these. The uh, Army supplied the planes and pilots, the Forest Service supplied observers. And it was, it was a public relations sensation and was very effective in uh, combating light burning as well as fires. And there are actually some, uh, there are actually some movie pictures of these as well. Uh, the Forest History Society has, has had some. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is from Clark Akatif, and uh, uh, he's curious. He likes to know more about the forest fire painting you use for your presentation. Oh, my favorite fire painting, and you will see hundreds of versions of this all over the place. Uh, this was done by a Russian artist, uh, Alexei uh, Denisov Yurolsky, uh, and this it, he submitted it for the uh, World's Fair in 1904 at St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, uh, it disappeared. Uh, it showed up at, uh, anyway, I, I've written a story about this. If, if um, the questioner is interested, if, if we could get in contact, I could show, I, I've written an article about this. It's an extraordinary story. And it, it finally disappeared for years. It believes it's been, it's believed to be found now in the basement of an art museum in Tomsk. Siberia. Wow. But he did, uh, he did uh, a whole variety of these. He was obsessed by it. In fact, there was a whole Russian school of art on fires in the late 19th, early 20th century. It's a I great see. story, by the way, but I, 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 won't, I won't bore people with it now, if, but I, I could put you on to a, an article on it. Yeah, I think um, uh, with your permission, both uh, you, Steve and Gray, uh, everybody who comes to the, came to the talk uh, gets links and, you know, the recording of the session and all of that. Uh, and if you both don't mind, we can also include your email addresses so people can connect back with you. But that's, let me know if sure. that's possible. Okay. Yep. Um, that's mm -hmm. that'd be great. Mm -hmm. okay. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, so next question, um, um, before I go on, let me just quickly uh, make an announcement to everyone. 
please uh, use the Q&A box to ask questions um, because um, that way we make sure uh, there's, there's, you know, everybody who's in line gets to gets their questions uh, answered first. So uh, with that, uh, this is, uh, this uh, question is from Lucia Lobison and this is for uh, Steve. Uh, you, uh, do you note an increase in forest fires and is that due to increased density of population, the encroachment or climate change or other factors according to your experience? Well, that's a tough one. I'd, I'd want to know at a particular place um, what the combination was. We're, we're always being asked, what's the driver behind these large fires? And I regard fire as a driverless car. It's a reaction. It's just barreling down the road. It's integrating everything around it. And different things at different times and places loom larger. So climate change is becoming a factor, but certainly the character of the landscape, its susceptibility to fire uh, are important. Uh, how humans interact with it, what kind of fires we cause. Uh, probably half of all of the really, the most severe fires in the last 20 years have been caused by um, uh, power lines. Uh, well, that's surely a fixable problem. And that's just not in California. Uh, big fires in Texas in 2011, um, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, uh, burn for heaven's sakes, that was power line fires. So it's, it's as Greg points out, it's a, it's a matter of our entire infrastructure that we've allowed to decay and we need to rebuild it with fire as well. So there are lots of things. More people does not necessarily mean more fires. As you get greater and greater people, the intensity of living on the land is such that there can be fewer fires. If you convert to an industrial model, uh, you take fire out. So that uh, cities, uh, modern cities are little inclined to burn unless there's an earthquake or a war or a major civil unrest. So, so that might be another one where uh, I can answer by email in more depth if, if person, uh, yeah, yeah, wanted to follow up. Sounds good. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this uh, next question um, uh, is, for, uh, is also for, for Steve at this point. Uh, this is, uh, so, kind of a more broad statement. So is it all a matter of living with fire? Yeah, hi, Marty. Yeah, uh, I'd like you to ask that question. Yeah, but living with fire means different things and it means different things to different people. I think we have to accept that fire is here. It's not going away and in many ways we need it. Um, we can't treat our countryside the same way that we have our, our houses and cities where you can more or less control everything about that built environment and you can control fire pretty effectively. We can't extend that same kind of control elsewhere. So we have to live with it, but what does it mean? What does that really mean? It may mean that we have to substitute our fires uh, for nature's uh, or controlled fires for wildfires. It may mean we have to manage the landscape so that any kind of fire that occurs is something that we can live with, that we can accommodate uh, and, not, and not cause damage. Um, I mean, we need to dial down, to ratchet down our burning of fossil fuels as fast as we can, but that will also mean, I think, that we will be ratcheting up our burning of living landscapes. We have a huge fire deficit uh, in most of these, and we will see a lot more fire rather than less. It will just be a more helpful fire rather than the damaging ones that, that we seem to be left with. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, another uh, uh, attendee asks, um, are you using pyrocene uh, synonymously with anthropocene? Yeah, good question. Uh, my sense is, is yes, uh, and I don't expect pyrocene to become an internet meme uh, anytime soon, if ever. Uh, I like a long Anthropocene. I think humans have been interacting uh, and shaping the landscape uh, for all of the, the interglacial. So you've got a rapidly warming earth that meets a fire-wielding creature, and we have been changing and affecting the climate ever since. But we went, as I say, on afterburners uh, with with fossil fuels and that has unhinged uh, much of the rest of it. So I think pyrocene is describing the Anthropocene from its power source, which is our, our unique capacity uh, to burn things. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, unfortunate. Yes. Um, so, um, this is more of a comment uh, rather than a question, but I, I think maybe both of you can comment back. Uh, this is from Stephen Friedman. Uh, and he, he says, uh, I have found it interesting that we finally realize how suppressing fires over the past hundred years has actually been exacerbated by the warming and drying of the Western United States. What may have been a, a manageable situation has turned into an untenable situation instead. The net result is extensive burns where the intensity of the burn has often left vast areas devoid of a regenerative growth for miles, making recovery nearly impossible. So, um, any, any well, certainly climate change. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would. My sense is that climate change is acting as a performance enhancer on a lot of pre-existing conditions, and part of that has to do with the character of the landscape, its combustibility, its enhanced combustibility because of removing fire and doing other things in the landscape. Uh, but also we've removed some of our ability to maneuver by building more and more exurbs um, in, in these fire prone areas. Mm. Although I would also point out that the story has, has been one of dumb Westerners building houses where there are fires, mm -hmm. but we're seeing with climate change and land use that the fires are starting to go where the houses are, which is in the Southeast and the Eastern U S. Right. So, yeah, at some point, it will become national. At that point, it may become a national issue. Gray, do you want to add? or Actually, this is one of the things that, yeah, um, because actually it's one of the slides I didn't see. <laughs> Canyon, um, where I think it's been about six years since we had the Rim Fire up there, which was over 400 square miles. And um, I see it every time I go up to Yosemite on Highway 120. Um, and that fire was really ferocious. And the, um, it's not growing back as forests. Um, it looks, uh, it's, a, it's a moonscape up there. At least the last time I went up there, it was. And um, I think that's largely because all the seed trees burned, um, but also, of course, the organic matter in the soil burned. It was baked. And... Um, it looks like a pro the, the process of desertification is actually taking place in the Sierra foothills. Um, but Stephen probably knows much more about that fire than I do, but I, I find it very alarming every time I go through that region. Mm, okay. Stephen? Well, we're, we're seeing more severe fires and it's not clear that they, the forests are going to bounce back into their prior condition, particularly with climate change, invasive species, right. and other things. Mm -hmm. I don't think we really know. We're, going, we're creating mm -hmm. a world where fire is going to be more prominent and probably more threatening unless we begin, can, begin exercising some reasonable relationship with it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, one of the problems with that fire, of course, is that it, there's going to be a tremendous amount of sedimentation in Don Pedro Reservoir, which is part of the Hetch Hetchy system, which provides water, of course, to not just San Francisco, but a good deal of Silicon Valley and the peninsula as well, too. So, you know, it's all it's all connected. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the next question uh, is from Shannon Gonzalez. And uh, this is uh, uh, this is for you, Gray. Uh, is there public GIS data as accessible for the Ponderosa Fibre? Not that I know of. That's why it's been so difficult to do research on this, particularly um, under lockdown. Um, as I said, Betty Elaine Smith's only one uh, Ray, water, could you um, repeat, a stretch uh, of the Ponderosa Way was. Could you repeat uh, when you said Betty Lane? Uh, we lost you. Yeah, um, Professor Betty Elaine Smith's um, project, where she assigned this is a project to a cartography class, is the only one that I know of where there is a um, very detailed map. And as she said in that text that I read, um, it was very difficult for them to even discover where the Ponderosa Way went. And, I, and Doug Laurie up in, uh, now in Chico actually confirmed that, um, that parts of it are just disappearing. Also, um, 
because it's on private land, um, it goes through some of the timber land up there that Sierra Pacific owns, and they're they're building or they they've already built um, fences and gates across the road. All that I can tell, um, there's it's just vanishing or has already vanished, and so it's very difficult. I've actually been contacted by. Um, a long distance bicyclist and also um, an off-road vehicle enthusiast who would like to do the entire to find it and determine where it is. Uh, Gray, uh, we, we lost you a couple of, of spots there. Oh, uh, you, oh, I'm you, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you were saying about about the fact that these the, the, the Ponderosa Way is on private lands and then we lost you a little bit. So maybe you can oh. quickly summarize. Well, I was just saying that um, where it crosses Sierra Pacific land, mm -hmm. which is a lumber company, they're building gates across it. Um, so you can't actually use the Ponderosa way. And then the other thing is just that it's vanishing. So that it's very difficult on the ground to determine where it is. I'm sure there are maps of it, more detailed maps somewhere, but we're going to have to get over this pandemic. Uh, right. to get into the various archives to find where that is. Maybe they'll be at the Rumsey Center. Maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, Gray, uh, the next question is also for you. Um, this is from Brent McKee. Uh, and he says, many rich Americans are buying multiple mansions, mega yachts from Europe and doomsday bunkers in New Zealand. Since those things don't create many American jobs, why not tax them more, create a new CCC, um, the core and rebuild the Ponderosa way. <laughs> well, I'm all for that, Brent. <laughs> you might've been able to tell. As I said, we need collective investment. That's the only way we can maintain our infrastructure. And that of course is gonna require taxes. And those are exactly the kind of people to provide for public safety, and not just in fire breaks, but in other other things such as our bridges, for example, and our water systems. Got it. Um, uh, thank you. Oh, and public health. Public health as well, too. Um, one in the, our entire public health system. Well, this is going to require taxes. Um, so uh, uh, the next question is for both of you, actually, and I think it is more about cartography. Uh, Shannon Gonzalez asks again, a uh, question for both speakers, is there a national standard for fire maps slash map symbols? As more fires occur and mapping needs increase, it'd be good to have some standards for mappers to make sure that they're still, that's, they're, they're saying the same story across the board. Um, like, you know, the fire break symbol equals, you know, some symbol that's nationwide, maybe inter international too. So if you want to take that first grade. I, I didn't understand that. Could you repeat oh, it? The question is about symbology. So is there a mm -hmm. sim symbol that's common for fire mapping? Um, like, like, for example, your fire break, is there a symbol for it that's just kind of a national symbol? Uh, just a general question, more about symbology and cartography. I'm not aware of any. That's a very good question, but I'm not aware of any. I mean, they're usually just shown as a kind of, um, you know, a sort of minimal road. Um, but uh, in the case of the of the Ponderosa Way, as I've said, it's, it's vanishing. Doug Laurie tells me that the Forest Service is actually erasing it from maps in Tehama County. In the more recent maps, you can't even find the, the traces of it anymore. Steve, do you know? Gosh, I'm not a cartographer. I don't know of any, um, but uh, there's certainly a need for better fire mapping of ongoing fires and sort of the geography of fire, that would be a great project. We have really crummy metrics for fire. We don't really know what we're talking about. We basically have numbers of fires, burned area, and cost. And it's a much more complicated problem than that. And we, 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 so part of getting those metrics, I think, would be creating a cartography 
that would be appropriate to help answer the questions we need answered. Got it, got it. Um, thank you, uh, thank you both. So next question is from uh, uh, Perry McCarty. Uh, and the question is, is concern about particulates from burns enough that it won't occur? Is it justified? I don't quite fully understand the, uh, the question. Um, is, is uh, concern? Yeah, go ahead. No, it, it's, I'm guessing that it's about uh, controlled burning or prescribed fire, which mm -hmm. is going to release smoke and particulates can be a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the question here is much like flame. Do we want really large uncontrolled fires or lots of small more or less controlled ones. Do we want our smoke in huge smoke palls or do we want it in seasonally prescribed small doses? In effect, uh, smoke might be a seasonal nuisance in the same way that certain allergies are. Mm. Um, but we're going to have fire and we're going to have particulates and we, we, need to, we need to find ways to live with it. Right, right. Uh, thank you. So uh, next uh, question is really for both of you, but it's kind of a really general question. I mean, a specific question that can be generalized. I live in, this is from uh, Karen Tillene Lawton, and she says, I live in an urban wi slash wildlife interface in Santa Barbara. How do you see these areas in, say, 50 years? Steve, do you want to tackle that first? Yeah. Um, the wildland urban interface, as the name suggests, is, is kind of an awkward, it's a big issue, but it's an awkward one. And part of it is that it got defined by the wildland community. And the problem was defined as one of people building houses and encroaching on largely uh, open land. And that made them vulnerable to fire and made fire management difficult, complicated. But you know, it, we could pick up the other end of that stick just as easily and say, these are really urban enclaves with funny landscaping. If you define it as a wildland problem with houses, it's very difficult to solve. If you define it as an urban problem with uh, peculiar um, settings and landscapings, then it's pretty clear what you have to do. You have to do the same things that we, that we did to take fire out of our large cities. Uh, so I think part of the problem is, is was initially one of definition, which continues. Uh, if these places are going to survive, they are going to, to have to harden themselves against the fires. And there's lots and lots of research that suggests if you want to protect communities from burning, that is where you put your, your effort. You put it on the, on the actual structures. And we know how they, oh, and why they get ignited how they propagate, it's very largely a question of embers. I mean, thousands and thousands of embers, like, like a swarm of locusts on fire uh, coming in and finding points of vulnerability. Well, we, we, there are a lot, there's a lot of research on that. So I would hope that by 50 years, I would hope that within 10 years, uh, we pretty much have, we could, if we chose, uh, we could eliminate the kinds of fires that we're seeing now in those communities. But to address yep. that caller, of course, she's calling from, I think you said Santa Barbara. Yeah. And you might remember that it, just a few years ago, there was a big fire up in the San Inez Mountains behind Santa Barbara. Um, and there was a, essentially a mud boulder tsunami that came yeah. down and wiped out part of Montecito, yeah. a very wealthy town down there. So it's not just a matter of the fire, of course, it's the aftermath of the fire, especially if you get a strong rainstorm immediately after um, when there's nothing to anchor the soil anymore. Yeah, good, good point. point. Um, so uh, uh, next question, uh, and I think this, uh, this is for Gray, how would radio avenues in San Francisco uh, have mitigated fire damage? Um, I think you're referring to that map the plan. Yeah. Well, the idea, D Daniel Burnham's because you have these wide boulevards like Market or, or Van Ness, uh, but you would have other ones 
uh, that would cut the um, the uh, city into various quadrants where, in fact, you could contain a fire. It would take out a lot of blocks because the city is so flammable, but uh, it wouldn't burn the whole city down. And that's what happened essentially in the 1906. The only way that they were able to stop the fire from burning into the Western Edition and taking out the entire city was that the uh, firemen and the army made a stand on Van Ness Avenue and blew up the houses, the, the mansions um, on the, um, the east. And then I think on the west side of Van Ness Avenue and create a fire break by essentially destroying the buildings on both sides of it, which stopped the fire. Otherwise it would have essentially erased San Francisco altogether probably. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Um, and so this question, I think we, I can answer too. Uh, this is by Jeff Olves and he asked, where can we find Gray's article on the history of the Ponderosa Way? Uh, Gray uh, is gonna we'll talk, send it to me, we'll send it to everyone. So uh, it'll be part of the email we send when we do the video. Does sound good, Gray? Okay, I think we've lost uh, audio from Gray here. Okay. Great, so let's go to the next question. Um, how does the strategy of creating physical fire breaks work? Uh, uh, do they work in tandem with other methods like permaculture and also breaking natural networks like mycelium, tree root networks and other fascia health properties slash nutrient systems, for example, high basis breakup pro diversity systems. This is for you, Greg. Well, um, I am not an expert on fire breaks just on the Ponderosa Way. And I'm sure that they weren't um, that environmentally conscious at the time that they were building it. As I said, they built it very fast. Um, and as far as I can see, they largely built it with hand labor, um, but they don't have the kind of masticators and excavators and such with treads that we have now, which can do that kind of work very fast. But um, they essentially just blasted that um, fuel break through the, the landscape and they were not, their concern was not the kind of environmental concern that we have now. Uh, as I said, I found when I was trying to build one um, um, in Inverness, there were, of course, concerns for the birds. It's the beginning of nesting season for endangered plants, endangered frogs, etc. You run into all these problems now. So um, it certainly wasn't their concern now. Um, Stephen, do you know um, if these are taken into consideration in building fuel breaks now? I don't know. Uh, the last great push for fuel breaks in California, I think, was after the 1970 fires. And you could see them all along the ridge tops of Southern California mountains. And they've all decayed, almost all of them. And part of the problem with, one problem with fuel breaks is that they can't stop fires in high winds, which are the problem fires. And secondly, they're expensive to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are a few places where they survive, but most places they don't. And now there is a pushback because because disturbing the land where you have invasive grasses in particular, the fuel breaks can then become fuses for fire oh. rather than uh, breaks for them. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what the right mix should be. Um, and in some ways, I think to use your levy analogy, it's sort of like a better approach might be some select levies, but otherwise floodplain management. Mm -hmm. So managing the fire environment over a larger area with select use of fuel breaks uh, would probably make more sense. Mm -hmm. But I don't think anybody has got anybody uh, has got this figured out, and I don't see a push for more fuel breaks anytime soon. The effort seems to be handling over a larger area where possible. Steve, how, could you explain how they would act as a as a fuse? Oh well, because. Uh, suppose you've got uh, chaparral or trees, uh, a forest around them, uh, and these become vulnerable or taken over, infested, if you will, by brome, uh, cheatgrass, or something of that sort, then um, that those cure out earlier. If a fire got started, then it would run along the fuel break and then spread 
outside, right. it would it would do exactly the opposite of what you want. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, how likely is that and how often? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, fuel breaks are not in favor right now, but I think large area fuel management is. Uh, thank you, Paul. That, that was an, that's really a good question about, about uh, uh, whether or not uh, fuel breaks are viable, both uh, just on the ground and even politically, it seems like. So uh, thank you for that. This is uh, this quest next question is from David McMillan, and this is for either speaker. Uh, will the fuel burden created by fire suppression eventually be paid off? Uh, paid off in quotes. Uh, can we leave, can we reach a fuel slash forest to load balance? Steve, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, that, that's, that's probably for me. And uh, I think the simple answer is that yes, we will eventually have a balance. The question is uh, whether it's damaging uh, or whether we can manage it somehow uh, to bring this in, into some kind of. Um, the, there are lots and lots of efforts to think about reducing or rearranging fuels, um, and they really vary by place. Uh, and there are places where uh, wood chipping, masticating uh, would be uh, appropriate. There, there are places where uh, thinning, which is a kind of woody weeding, not logging, but a kind of woody weeding of the vegetation is appropriate. Most of these um, interventions eventually and ultimately assume that we will be restoring controlled fire in there, mm. that fire will return on a more uh, manageable level and uh, preferably that we will be able to do it. But if not, if the fuels are in, um, oh, a less explosive, less volatile condition, then even if there are wildfires, we can contain them. Mm. But this is a this is a, a subject of enormous research and a great deal of uh, dispute uh, because people take what works in one place and try to apply it in another, and it, that fails. So I think we have to be very site specific. But eventually, yes, there will be some equilibrium, uh, either through wildfires or or deliberate burning uh, associated with other with other with other actions. It it sounds very much. Uh how a geographer would approach the problem, which is, you know, you really have to take the nuances, right? You can't just yeah. take something that works in one and just kind of apply it to the other. So I appreciate that very much. Um, uh, the next question is from Galen Peterson, and she asks, what are your thoughts about a dense urban community, such as Coffee Park, Coffee Park in Santa Rosa, which burned over in the 2017 Tubbs fire being reconstructed without chapter 7a and she says bracket wildfire building codes is it possible that fire could impact the area in the same way again within the decade how effective do you think these codes are outside of the wui thank you um well my understanding is that there have been fires about every 50 years roughly the same the same area burns, the same wind mm -hmm. uh, and meteorological conditions. I think there were fires in, in the 1920s and I think maybe in the 70s as well. Uh, the issue here is to really, we thought that urban fire had gone away uh, and we didn't need to worry about urban fire in the same way. You know, it's, it's come back. It's like, you know, polio coming back or measles. We, we quit doing all the things that, that had taken it out. We need to accept the possibility that urban conflagrations are now uh, part of the mix and to plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm Great. not, I'm really not an oh, urban oh. fire guy. So I... Salim, I, 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 I can say that, um, you know, we've, we've made big progress in hardening our structures. Um, there are a lot of materials now that weren't being used even 10 years ago. And so when uh, communities like Kofi Park are built back, they can be built in a very different way. And of course they wouldn't have the same kind of landscaping either, but that fire was really a freak. Um, you know, it came down so fast. It was so wind driven. It jumped highway 101 as these kinds of fires do these days. Um, but a lot can be done. Um, 
I've done it to my house uh, in Inverness. And of course, you can clear a lot of land around it. But the people in, in that neighborhood never expected a fire to impinge on them that way. I mean, they're pretty far, actually, from the wooded hills to the east. And they just weren't expecting that. Um, I did see the Oakland Hills fire in 91, and I'll never forget it. I mean, I watched it for much of the night from Albany Hill, and it was just a terrifying experience. It really made me into a kind of pyrophobe, um, because uh, uh, um, I guess that's one of the reasons I'm so interested in this subject and trying to make sure that I, I don't see something like that again. Right, right, right. And uh, maybe, maybe some, some of the things that... Uh... Uh, Steve had mentioned earlier about making our houses a uh, fireproof, so to speak, you know, the embers is something you mentioned about them just coming in. We've got all of these fuel and they'll just light up, but uh, uh, we're hope let's hope it won't take very long, maybe that, less than a decade for all of this to happen. But uh, all right. Well, thank you both for that. Uh, this next. Aline, two yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Grace. I just wanted to say um, after the Oakland Hills fire, um, I'd actually forgotten this. After the Open Hills fire, I did an article for the Chronicle, which I might be able to get to you, about how some architects like Bernard Maybeck in Berkeley um, actually um, abandoned the kind of houses that they'd been building before. Well, no, no, excuse me. That was uh, before after the 1923 fire that wiped out over 600 houses in the Berkeley Hills. And they saw the error of their ways and actually began building in concrete and stucco with red tile roofs and things. So this is nothing new. Um, right. you know, other architects and planners have actually addressed these problems in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gray, you, you, you said something um, about abandoned and after that we lost you for, uh, for a bit there. What did, could you just uh, rephrase? Uh, what, where did you lose you said, me? You said that architects abandoned and I, and then we lost you. So, <laughs> well, we can come back to it. Well, I, yes. Let's, let's well, come I'm back. Just In some ways, if, if I could interrupt with a, with an analogy, in many ways, fire is a contagion phenomenon. It spreads the same way. And we could think about the variety of things we have to do uh, in the current pandemic uh, to reduce the spread can also be applied to fire. So we think about aerosols spreading uh, of the virus. Well, that's, uh, that's like embers. Well, you wear masks, that's hardening houses. Um, social distancing, that's like uh, maintaining uh, defensible space around the structure and herd immunity, having enough. It has to be a community solution to do that. Otherwise, you're vulnerable to everybody else. So. Yeah, no. Oh, that's that's an excellent analogy. I mean, I think everybody can can kind of just understand that right away. So thank you for that. Um, so the the next two questions uh, really uh, are really interesting, um, and they're kind of just really uh, uh, down to earth sort of questions. Um, and I'm really interested in the answers. Uh, Mike Kent asks, uh, and and again, this could be for both of you. Uh, it sounds like uh, both of you know some of these uh, these folks uh, who are coming and uh, listening to you. Uh, he, said, he asked, what are the top low-hanging fruit with respect to wildfire prevention and management policy in California or maybe the West, you know? Uh, Steve, you want to take that? It's kind of more of a broader... Sure. Well, the... The, the, yeah, well, the, the, I mean, the crisis issues have been uh, fires blasting into communities, um, I mean, killing people, um, burning houses and so forth. And if you could get uh, rebuild uh, your power lines, in effect, our power structure, our infrastructure, mm -hmm. which we need to rebuild anyway, for lots of reasons, uh, that would eliminate probably half of the worst fires because they fail in high winds which is exactly the time where the fires, anything that starts is going to be uncontrollable. So we could have twice as much firefighting apparatus, but under those conditions, we're not going to do it. We need to do that anyway for power um, and you know, converting uh, to other kinds of energy sources. So that would be a big one. And then I think getting serious about um, um, these codes uh, and building, treating these communities as um, urban, uh, urban, 
places and applying the same kinds of standards that we would for a city. People won't like that, but otherwise uh, we're all vulnerable uh, to our neighbors if, if, we, if we take protective measures and they don't. Those are the two simplest things right off the bat that you could do fairly quickly. The longer term things of getting the landscape itself into better form is going to be a harder project and a more controversial one. But let's tackle the, the two that are resulting in the most damages. Great. Uh, uh, thank you. So uh, great, this uh, question is for you. Uh, uh, this is from Gareth Hoskins and he asks, uh, I wonder how uh, women were included in the CCC. Um, for that matter, I'm of course also interested in, in other uh, um, segments of uh, the population, African-Americans, Asians, that sort of thing. Uh, was the New Deal uh, conservation initiative as progressive the gender as it was to economics? So that's kind of the second part of the question. As to what? As to economics. So basically- it, Was say, it just progressive? Yeah, as progressed, the, yeah. Shall I read it again? Uh, no, 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 that's fine. Um, yeah, it, it has been criticized because it did not, there was no room for women in it. It was a time of, you know, strict gender role playing or, or stereotypes. So it was considered that women simply couldn't do the kind of hard work that the men were doing. And there was a, a brief attempt by Eleanor Roosevelt to create a female auxiliary to the CCC, which derisively became known as the she, she, she. And a few of those camps were set up, but they didn't do the same kind of work that the men did. Um, uh, very, very work being addressed um, in the state conservation corps like California has, for example, those um, have gender equity. And also, of course, they're much more. A great book um, by um, Olin Cole Jr. Um, on the African-American experience in the CCC from which I learned a great deal about the degree to which they attempted um, in but it was, as I said, um, segregated half at the beginning. And uh, I strongly recommend that book, The African-American Experience in the CCC. Thank you, Gray. Um, uh, the, uh, the next question is it's just more of a thank you. It's from Peter Carpenter. He says, as a former Northern Florida pine forest uh, Pine Forest volunteer firefighter and also Region 5, California, USFS smoke jumper. This discussion has been superb. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, too, for being a volunteer firefighter. So that's, uh, that's great. Um, Paul Stars has um, uh, uh, shared a link about uh, framing the wide open spaces of Nomadland, the, the movie. Uh, we'll see if you can get that in the email that everybody's gonna be sent out, uh, that everybody will get. Um, this is a question for, for Gray. Um, uh, are there more sources for the early integration of the Conservation Corps? And this is by Eduardo Piñata. Um, are there more sources for the early integration of the Conser Conservation Corps? I think he means the people uh, or, or sources of research. Mm -hmm. not Owen Cole's book is the only one that I know of, but um, I'm a little bit behind my uh, the time in that. I mean, I get a little bit tired of the um, sort of tired trope that the New Deal or the CCC was being credit for at least an attempt at racial equity. And by the way, it wasn't just African-Americans. You can see in the archival photos that there were Hispanics involved too, and others as well too. Um, um, but they were definitely in the minority. There's no, no question about that. Um, but um, it, I think it's a rich field and I, I wish somebody would take it on actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Google uh, it. <laughs> yes, Google it, start there. Um, or 
go to your library. But uh, you can't do that right now in many ways. Yes. But some of the public libraries are open for uh, paging, but uh, it's very difficult, very different than uh, talking to a librarian. Um, next question is, I think I mean, this, this goes to Gray. Gray, you have another comment? So yeah, I just wanted to say that actually, um, we have a whole section of the Living New Deal website on inclusion, um, and it includes what various New Deal programs did, not just for African Americans, but for women, Jews, um, um, Asians, etc. Uh, it's a very complex field. Um, mm -hmm. You can't just um, uh, make categorical uh, charges against it, but a great deal was done for various people that had never been done before. Um, uh, uh, Native Americans, for example. There was a whole um, Indian New Deal at the time that very few people remember. Mm. So I, I urge you to go to those pages on inclusion. Um, this, uh, this question is from Alicia Torregrosa, and she asks, there are networks of shaded fuel breaks being built, but they only work after the wind-driven phase is down. How do you combat the perception that they don't work? Gray, uh, uh, lost you? Oh, oh you're just thinking. all fires. No, Go ahead. all fires aren't wind driven. I mean, we're we're looking at the sort of Santa Ana wind driven fires, um, but uh, Stephen will know better than I do how what proportion of the fires we're having now are that kind of fire. If a fire is slow moving, um, a shaded fuel break can actually to slow the, the fire down. If it is wind driven, especially if there's a, a heavy wind like there was um, the destroyed paradise, I don't think there's anything that can stop that. Stephen? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, there are many kinds of fire breaks, there are many kinds of fuel breaks. Uh, and there are many ways of integrating those with a larger program of fire and fuel management. So um, arguing sort of abstractly about something being good or bad doesn't mean anything. It's good or bad in a particular setting uh, under particular circumstances. And when we have the extreme fires, you're, you're simply left with hardening the structures if that's, if that's your concern. Um, but field breaks um, done well uh, can also allow other kinds of uh, prescribed burning and landscape management uh, in a benign way. So it's not just that they, they protect against these sort of outbursts of, of uh, um, conflagrations. Thank you, Gray. Thank you, Steve. Um, so next question is by Alan Teutschmann. And uh, this, is, this is a question for Gray. Um, much of the better known CCC work involves art and murals. Murals, are you aware of representation of the fires in the West and or Ponderosa way in art? Um, this is Betty Smith and Elaine, both of them together asking the question. I am not aware of that. That's a great question. Um, I'm not. But of course, since the New Deal had a very vigorous art program, um, the artists may have done that. But um, you can actually go online and just do a Google search for CCC images, um, and you will find hundreds of them. But I'm not aware of, of any, say, WPA paintings uh, or representations of uh, the, the boys fighting the fires. Stephen, again, do you know? I mean, you were in, um, at a CCC camp. You no, know, <laughs> uh, no, I don't know that. Uh, the WPA uh, murals project uh, did have some. There, there's a famous one uh, in Texas. It shows uh, a grass fire being controlled by uh, what was known as the uh, beef drag, which is uh, killing a steer and then dragging it over the the flame. Yeah, and, I remember uh, that. It's a, it's, a very mm -hmm. dramatic, it's a very dramatic shot. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, Frederick Remington uh, did a piece on that. Yeah, it's a post office. I think maybe in Plano, Texas. I can't remember yeah, where right. the Texas post. So there were, there were some, there were some of that sort. Uh, and there, there were a few, I think, WPA 
ones, but not uh, CCC. No, I don't think they've. I don't recall any. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Betty, I know you uh, asked if you could speak. Uh, just in the interest of time, there's still 20 questions uh, waiting to be answered, and uh, I want to make sure um, we we have a shot at that, and also look at time. You've got about 20 minutes, so I'm gonna. Uh, move on to the, to the next question. And this is this next question has been sort of discussed. It's uh, a little bit, uh, but uh, this has to do with fire breaks. So this is John Cloud. Um, uh, on fire breaks, a solution in search of a problem, fire bur <laughs> fires burn whenever they burn. A revived CCC slash Living New Deal project that would be more productive would be extensive burning as under the rubric cultural burning, meaning there are more objectives than merely fuel load reduction. The techniques are complex, but can be learned, I think, would be more ecologically and socially productive. And he signs John Cloud in the howling wilderness of Washington, DC. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad, yeah, I'll, I'll start on this one. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad that was that was brought up because there are many forms of prescribed burning. And unfortunately, we go back to this question of how do we measure what we're doing? Our metrics for fire are really crummy. And fuel is something that can be measured. It's something that sounds a lot like silviculture. And so we're concerned about it. But a lot of the burning that we need to do is for ecological reasons. And cultural burning uh, also gets at that. And we really don't have good ways of, of coping. So we reduce everything to fuel, um, which is not very helpful. It, it's great around uh, sort of the wildland interface conditions, but it's not really helpful for managing fire on the land. We reduce everything, all of our biodiversity, all of our watersheds, all of the things we, ecological goods and services gets reduced to just uh, piles of hydrocarbon. And that's really not answering a lot of the things we're concerned with with fire. Gray, do you want to? Sorry, Gray, would you? Well, I, uh, I mean, I think of that article that I read from from American Forest. They were only concerned about the forests burning, um, and that was 1934. Um, it, the situation is very, very different. When, they're, when you build cities and towns and trailer parks in the way, um, it makes it difficult, if not impossible, to have cultural kinds of burnings because um, the fire has to be kept out of those areas um, because it could result of the SLA. Rise. The gravy lost the Actually, last. there are right. Actually, it is possible to do uh, some burning and some burning goes on around communities, but they have to have the larger environment in a condition that can tolerate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Um, next question is by Angela Moscow and uh, she asks, um, I would be interested in Professor Pine's concept of pyrocene in the context of deforestation trends associated with development pressures? I'm not sure how to answer that. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, clearly we're, you know, if, if you deforest, a lot of, we're back to another case of people lumping as fire, a lot of things that, yes, involve combustion, but are really very different kinds of fires. So fire from uh, land clearing and conversion in the Amazon uh, gets lumped with uh, draining and burning in peat in Indonesia, gets, gets lumped up with uh, fires burning into California cities, uh, gets lumped with um, burning for ecological purposes in Everglades. Uh, somehow they're all fire. And no, we need, we need to disentangle those. My sense of a pyrocene grows out of my uh, my understanding that we are, you know, a uniquely fire creature. Uh, we are the keystone species for fire on the planet. We have a fire. We have a monopoly over fire, mm -hmm. as a, a species monopoly over it, and we are on a, a a uniquely fire planet. 
and how that interaction between our capacity and the planet's receptivity to it and long experience with fire is what I is what underwrites my concept of a pyrocene. Mm. So this might be another case where an email we we could isolate the particular question. Well, definitely send the emails out so people can connect with each other. Thank you, Steve, for that. Um, uh, so uh, the next question is for Gray and uh, Gareth Hoskin asks, is the insurance industry complicit, complicit in urbanization of the foothills by enabling it and increasing resilience in a very precarious uh, environment? Is it increasing or decreasing? I don't know. I think maybe he meant decreasing, but Gray, if you want to respond to that. Salim, I didn't get the first yeah. Part so, of so, so is that. the insurance industry complicit in urbanization of the foothills by enabling it and increasing resilience in a very precarious environment? And I think uh, decreasing is the right term here, but, but uh, that's, that's kind of uh, how the question is asked. I'm not sure it's so much the private insurance industry as perhaps um, uh, federal and, and state um, insurance, um, but it's true that uh, fire insurance and flood insurance um, policies are going the same direction, that um, insurance companies simply are of these colossal catastrophes that we're having now, and they're starting to pull out. Gray, uh, we, we uh, lost the uh, um, first sentence of your question. And I think, Would you please repeat? Oh, trust me. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can oh, hear you. Yeah. Um, the connection. Um, it's it, the the insurance company of insuring now, and I think that will have a definite on the people can um, or flood insurance. Um, they're going to really think twice or three times about building in known hazard zones, as they have been doing so freely in the last decades. So I think real put on development um, as insurance as insurance companies pull out. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, this is a couple, next couple questions uh, are both about Ponderosa Way. Uh, Gary Adest asks, uh, I live in, says, I live in Springville in Tulare County at the foot of the mountains. Uh, do you know where the Ponderosa Way uh, went through, uh, did go through our town. What was the town? Springville in Tulare County. No, I don't. Um, if it was about the 2000 foot elevation, it probably ran through there. Mm -hmm. But um, that part of the Ponderosa Way is the least well documented. I haven't seen any maps of that area. Do some research and contact me. <laughs> uh, they, uh, the 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 um, another sort of more general question from Keith Machowski. It says, "Were there fire breaks uh, the equivalent of Ponderosa Way, or was it unusual in its size and scale?" That's a great question. I found one reference when they were beginning to build Ponderosa Way that they were going to build Ponderosa Ponderosa Way two down the coast range, at least in the northern part of the coast range. But that's the only reference I've found to it. I don't think it was ever done. Okay. I mean, that was a, it was billed as the largest fire break in the world. And I think that that probably is true. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So next uh, question, Kurt Beichheimer, Beichmeyer, sorry. Uh, asks, are tribal communities reintroducing traditional fire strategies? And if so, how effectively? Steve, you want to tackle that? 
Sure. Uh, well, they are. Uh, it varies, of course, by, by tribe and place and what their heritage of fire was. Uh, it's also becoming a major uh, theme in Australia uh, and some other parts of the world where uh, people are looking to traditional uh, knowledge and traditional practices uh, as a way of reintroducing controlled fire back into the landscape. Uh, and this folds in for many of the tribes with, with other efforts to sort of reclaim their identity, reclaim their heritage. They can see that as, as fire as being a part of it. Uh, is it effective? Uh, it depends on you know, the place and circumstances as always. Uh, but the way in which we have traditionally done prescribed burning in the United States, which was really developed in Florida, uh, is a kind of set piece. And that has not been able to scale up, certainly not to scale up in the West. And we need to think of other ways of reintroducing uh, fire. And I think we, by studying how did people do this for thousands of years without burning themselves out, um, we can learn and find sort of uh, modern uh, equivalents for this and be able to do more burning in a benign way at scale. Right now, simply expanding what we're doing presently, uh, we, we can't do it. I mean, we're, we're left managing wildfires as an alternative. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a great future in cultural burning, not only for the tribes, but in finding ways to adapt techniques of traditional burning uh, to modern circumstances. Thank you. Uh, the next thing is, it's just a comment. Uh, it's, a, it's a compliment. I just will quickly say planning. This is by George Sikinen, and he says planning for where there are safe areas for development and building codes for acquiring fire resistant design and construction are part of the mix in terms of managing the exurban suburb slash suburban interface with forests and wildlands. Uh, I think this talks to uh, something we, we, one of the questions we had, uh, he says, thank you gentlemen for a most informative, informative and very profound set of presentations. Signing off from Mackie. So that's, uh, that's nice of him. Um, uh, the next question is, um, I, I, I just want to quickly say, I want to be mindful of time. We're coming up, uh, up to the five o'clock hour here in California and uh, six o'clock for Steve. So, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll just go through the next few questions here. There's 15 left and I'm sorry, I don't think we'll get to all of them, but I do want to, just in the interest of everybody's time, um, we will stop at five. So let's just keep going really quickly here. Uh, as uh, 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 Jay Martin asks, uh, uh, this is to Gray, uh, how would you rank the Ponderosa with other WPA projects in California in terms of people involved and difficulty and public value and other measures? Mm. Well, um, it's difficult to, connect, to compare the CCC with WPA and some of the other agencies. There was the PWA, which built Chasta Dam and Friant Dam, for example. So those were vastly larger than the Ponderosa Way. But I've seen one figure that 6,000 men were worked on the Ponderosa Way. So that was a huge labor force, but it's largely unskilled, although they were given skills um, in the CCC um, in the process. Many were set up for life actually by the kind of vocational training they got, but it's kind of apples and oranges to actually compare them. Um, but they did a tremendous amount of useful work. As I said, they, they worked all over Mount Tamalpais, which is now, um, one of the most dangerous fire um, prone areas that I know of actually, uh, because there hasn't been a fire there since 1929, I think it is. Mm. But uh, anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Paul Star asks, Paul Stars asks to both of you in Europe right now, there's significant effort on communities in the WUI to actually plant deciduous or fire resistant uh, crop trees, which is walnuts, almonds, stone, stone fruits, olives, in previously established fire breaks. This is part of the local fight against fascist forestry, where mm. central, when central government assumed authority 
over all forestry as a state government project. Any hope of seeing communities re-involved? So I guess he's asking, can we do that here? <laughs> yeah, um, well, I would hope so. Uh, and if we hope to succeed, we need to. And it's also a reminder that fuels management doesn't mean uh, just blocks of hydrocarbon. It can mean planting uh, orchards. It can mean planting uh, green uh, fuel breaks. Uh, there are lots of things. The European scene is very interesting because our wildland urban interface problem is one of people moving out into what had been rural, rural in effect, urbanites recolonizing rural or wildland. In Europe, particularly along the Mediterranean, it's a problem of people leaving the landscape, traditional mm -hmm. users leaving a rural landscape and having it overgrow. And so there the issue is to reestablish the traditional landscape and the kind of mixed landscape and burning and variety of practices that they had done for several thousand years, which is what held fire at bay. Hmm. Thank you. Um, in, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna quickly say, Jeff Olbs, uh, he's found ArcGIS, a link to ArcGIS data. If you can uh, either email me or put that in the chat box, I'm having a hard time uh, cutting and pasting it. So send that to me and we'll make it part of the, the email. Um, let's see. Uh, Scotty Strachan asks, Strachan asks, uh, this is for Steve, any research out there examining the historic fire data you showed with geomorphic features uh, along the lines of massive landscape change? Um, there's some pretty big hydroclimate hydroclimate swings in North America since 1800? Uh, good question. I don't know of any. Uh, they, there may be. Um, fire research was really a backwater uh, when I started, and it's really only maybe the last 20, 25 years that lots of other disciplines have piled in, and we're starting to see lots of things. So we can hope for these better connections, but I have to say that most of the change is attributable to human actions, mm -hmm. land use um, in the larger term. Right. Um, uh, uh, some comments uh, from Henley Schleiger, and I think this has to do with the cartography symbology thing. Uh, he says NWCG maintains a fire GIS standard. It, it largely exists, the cartography standard. So uh, uh, research for sure. Um, over there that can be done. Um, let's see, um, have any forest regeneration studies been done where the, where the Ponderosa Way used to be? Gray? What, what, I didn't hear the beginning of the- Yeah, yeah, so, so had there been any forest regeneration studies uh, in, the, in the Ponderosa Way area? I don't know of any. No. No. Um, all right. So, uh, but as I said, most people have never heard of the Ponderosa Way. You know, right. um, I actually talked to a, a, I talked to a past um, director of state resources in in California, and he had only vaguely heard something about it, but really didn't know very much about it. I mean, it's it's largely been entirely forgotten. It, if it wasn't for Matthias Gaffney's article. Um, we probably wouldn't be here talking about it. Right, right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this this talk is going to help, um, you know, and uh, of course we are really interested in the mapping angle, but this affects everybody. And uh, it's been great to, ha to have this kind of more in-depth um, uh, view, look into this, uh, this uh, uh, possibility. And I think also it, it puts the spotlight on it and says, well, maybe the, the break isn't the solution. Maybe it's part of the solution. And maybe it's just a, one of the things we need to do in a more conscious and, and targeted way. Um, I, uh, in the interest of time, uh, it's, it's five o'clock. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's already eight o'clock um, uh, on the East Coast and we have a few people there from there as well. Um, I'm going to end with just one question that I had and this is uh, for Steve and uh, I'm just interested in knowing, um, you know, given that you've 
fought fires uh, in, in your previous life um, and uh, previous century, really, uh, in, a, in a way. How, how, how have things changed now uh, with respect to uh, fire mapping and uh, technology and other things that we've learned? Um, you know, I mean, one of the things with fire mapping, which is always an issue, is connectivity, right? So it's very, very nice to have a, uh, you know, a small iPad or whatever, but, but if there's no connectivity, you can't do anything. And so what I've heard uh, is that there are quick printouts that are made, paper is still used, this is the mapping piece, but I'm just generally interested, in, you obviously been following how they're fighting fires now, and I'm just, I love to hear maybe a couple points on, on how it's done now compared to when you were on the ground. Well, we were a small operation to begin with. We were what used to be called smoke chasers. We, we went out after lightning strikes uh, mm -hmm. in the back country. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the 15 seasons I was there, the largest fire we had was 300 acres in the park. And that was actually in a mesa within Grand Canyon. So why we were even there is another issue. Everything has scaled up enormously. Uh, and uh, I think what, what I find interesting, uh, I mean, the amount of science, the amount of technology, the proposals that are out there for mapping and other things are all astonishing. But the fundamental issue comes down to values, how we see ourselves and how we choose to live on the land, um, how we see ourselves uh, and in relation to private lives and public goods, um, these are really the drivers uh, for it. Um, mm. We could have a lot more technology. Knowing Finding fire center doesn't mean that we're managing fires in a sensible way. It may allow us to do what we were doing badly before better um, or more intensely. So I think what it comes down to finally, you know, science, technology can enable, but it doesn't really inform. Mm. And science can inform, but it doesn't really decide. The science doesn't tell us what to do. And it comes back to politics, values, uh, some kind of shared sense of what we want this land to be, how we choose to live on it, and what our relationship to fire is. And that is the fundamental issue. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to have more stuff, a lot more money, and more fires. We are not going to get ahead of it. So ultimately, it is a social, cultural, and political problem, politics being the realm where we should be able to work through it. Right, right. More stuff to burn, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I, I want to take this uh, opportunity uh, to uh, thank you both profusely for, for agreeing to talk, uh, com coming out here to California, as it were, and... Uh, for you, Steve, and, and down the road for you, Gray, and uh, doing this in a virtual way. Um, maybe we could follow up uh, after after another season or two and see where, where things uh, lie. Um, much appreciated. Uh, you had a really great audience and a fantastic set, set of questions. I um, appreciate everybody asking questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. We got to many. Uh, I think there were close to 60 or 70, and I think there are about 10 left. So. Um, we will share as much as we can um, in the email that comes out. Uh, basically, everything is recorded. We, we do a, some basic editing and we add um, links that are from the chat and uh, you'll get to be able to uh, pass this on. It'll also be on our YouTube channel. Um, just just uh, search for David Ramsey Map Center and it'll also go out in the newsletter and everybody who registered will, be, will get, get all of that. Um, and, uh, and, and last but not least, uh, I hope to see many of you um, on the 26th of March uh, for our Islamic mapping uh, exhibition. Uh, but with that, uh, again, many thanks, uh, Steve Pine, many thanks, Gray Bretch, and thank you both for making this happen. And uh, uh, I look forward to when you're open to have you come to the center and for everybody to you know, usually these talks are done at the center, that big screen that you see at the back here. Uh, there's a lot of fun things we can do. And ordinarily what we would do is we would do a pop-up, we'd have fire maps, you know, uh, that sort of thing. But uh, we can do that right now. So looking forward to that. Again, many thanks to all of you. We'll be signing off right now. Take care, everybody, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you, Bye. Celine. Bye. Take care. Mm -hmm.